Hi everyone, today I'd like to talk about East West Bank, uh, based in uh, Southern California. And I really came across this bank during the uh, Silicon Valley banks collapse and there was this huge bank scare with the regional banks. And I thought, you know, let's be greedy when others are fearful. And so I took advantage of the decline in uh, financials to actually um, sold some of my um, stake and repurchase East West Bank after reading uh, the earnings transcript to, get, to start digging uh, more into it. Now, one thing that caught my eye during the earnings transcript was when the CFO said um, that she took out cash from right hand and bought stock uh, during the great dips. And hopefully that uh, investors will know that when the CFO buys stocks, manager has great confidence in the bank. Now, um, I think that was one key area that I thought was quite uh, strong and persuasive uh, because people always have their best interests in hearts and management knowing the bank the best uh, would be dumb to actually purchase stock unless they feel they can make money or they get good value uh, from it. So uh, it wasn't just the CFO itself actually, when you keep reading it, the CEO even said that it wasn't coordinated that uh, the management uh, across the board was buying the stock uh, at that at those great declines and those sharp um, decreasing valuations. So after I bought it, I started digging more and more into it to see if there's anything to worry about and whether or not I should keep that stake uh, and flip it back to my uh, previous uh, financial stock or uh, keep it uh, for more of long term. So when, when, when I take a look at it, it really, we look at a few parts. One is deposits, the cost of the bank to borrow money and whether they have left the bank during the crisis. So overall, at the deposit at the bank have increased year over year, slight and up slightly in Q2. Uh, just to provide some perspective, Bank of America, the largest US retail bank, actually saw a decline in deposits as customers continued to draw down their savings. Uh, it's, not, it's, a chick, it's not really apples apples comparison, but it's definitely good to see that um, they're actually building up deposits. Now, one thing we have to think about as well is this is against the backdrop of the collapse of uh, the Silicon Valley Bank. If you'd like to know what happened there, uh, please check out my earlier video, which explained what happened. Uh, another one was that they actually borrowed $4.5 billion uh, against mortgages to provide more uh, liquidity, which was drew uh, as precaution in case there was a run on bank and to provide short-term liquidity to, to pay out uh, d depositors. And I think the actions that they have taken have shown that they are that they are very conservative, and um, the deposit actually end up staying with them. So that's actually a good news from that perspective. Now, one thing that we also have to look at is, okay, deposit and leave, but you know, what did you pay for those deposit? Did you pay an arm and a leg uh, to secure this deposit, or what happened? So, in the first part of filing, we actually see that the deposit mix um, has been increasing. Um, from the DDA, which is like checking accounts, to the higher uh, cost time deposits, uh, actually from Q3 when the rates, when the Fed started ra raising rates, uh, eight point one billion dollars uh, in Q1 of 2022 to fifteen point one billion um, by the Q1 of 2023, about eighty six percent increase, um, and in Q2, uh, Q2 2023 the Trend continued. Time deposit actually increased with 17 billion, more than doubling from the year before, at the expense of these checking accounts. Now, in earning calls, we I want to see if the, if this is something that is um, a proactive or whether this is something that was uh, a way to pay an arm and a leg to get to get those deposits to stay and to earn margins on it. So it's great to hear that it was actually a proactive push. So they actually started uh, during Q3 of 2022 to actually encourage their deposit base to lock in those better rates uh, as rates has been low for a very long time. And they continue to accelerate their process in Q4 and as well as in Q1. So they continue that phase to practically say, hey, let's lock in these great rates uh, at 3%, whatever percent it is, so that they can have a uh, much more certain deposit base as well as uh, keeping deposit in house. <clears throat> so from the overall look of it, we see that that's definitely increased uh, quite a bit. 
the increase in positive actually increased about 12 and a half, uh, 12.5x, and they are probably paying one um, percent more for the, these deposits than let's say the lowest cost space, which is like Bank of America, by over one percent. Now, there's nothing to be scoff at. One percent is actually huge, given that the net interest margins or the spread that they make is actually usually around two or three percent. So one percent more means one um, percent that they can't um, make. Uh, by, by paying more deposits. That said, it's not a fair comparison because deposits are very different. The, um, the East-West Bank is actually focused on the Asian community, while uh, the Bank of America is a cross-section of U.S. populations. Um, and I know as Asian, uh, my, like my parents and siblings, they're actually very savings-oriented, and they're more willing to lock in their cash for higher yields and kind of shop for yields, um, especially with their trusted bankers. So if you just, just give my mom a call, says, hey, there's a 4% or 5% yield CD right now for 12 months, you know, would you want to lock into it for 10,000, 20,000? Uh, she would jump um, on it and, 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 and secure that. So they definitely uh, have cash on hand and they're more than willing to park it in the higher yield given now that it's actually available. The other part is that um, uh, Bank of America, as a reference point, actually increased the deposit rates by 13.8%. Uh, sorry, 13.8x. So it's actually, they increase it much more um, than e East West Bank. And at the, same, at the same time, they also saw a decline in deposits. Uh, but again, they are paying more than Bank of America. And Bank of America actually said they, actually, they, have, to, they actually said they have too much deposits. So they're not pricing to retain or grow deposits. They're actually pricing uh, as they see fit to make money. So. It's a slightly different uh, aspect, perspective, but it's just good to just reference kind of the lowest cost of producer and what uh, they can actually do in between. So in short, from a deposit perspective, the deposit is actually quite sticky. The results were thin expectation given the push by management of lock-in rates for the consumers. Moreover, the company in second quarter earning call said that they're in the process of decreasing its broker deposit in favor of more organic ones at their lower overall deposit costs. Uh, that will likely continue to be offset by a shift towards more time deposits from DDA as uh, the consumers at US East West Bank want to acquire more yield uh, for their money. So overall, I think uh, we'll the current rates are sustainable um, and the net interest money that we have right now are probably going to be good. Now, next we have a look at another trouble area for banks and that's the securities book. So a lot of banks where it gets trouble is they part banks uh, park their deposits in many avenues, and one of the avenues might be losing out uh, money, arms, and legs. So let's take a look at where they parked it. Uh, so the banks can park it in loans by giving it to uh, people that actually need them, uh, to park it at the central bank uh, as cash, and third is actually by buying um, securities like treasury, uh, like treasuries and so forth. So during the low rates, so before Q2 of 2022, banks may be tempted to park their deposits uh, like the 5, 10, 15, 30 year uh, treasuries that were paying maybe 2, 3% at maximum at a time frame. As you can imagine, a lot of these treasuries are underwater, which means they're trading at 4, 5%, which means uh, they're currently not, um, you would take a loss if you decide to sell them today. Now, whether the banks can make this money on trades depending on the thickness of deposit and the cost of deposits, right? So if you have lots of cheap deposits that can stay for a long time, such as Bank of America, uh, that people will just have a lot of money in, in a checking account, then you're actually fine because these checking accounts, uh, you pay little to no interest on them. Uh, so you, by earning the 2% spread that you get from treasury or 3% spread from treasuries, you're actually making enough money uh, from it. Less, of course, the any fees that you have to pay for re for retail space and etc. Um, so looking at the bank securities, uh, we actually see that uh, they have two parts. One is AFS, which is available for sale, meaning that a bank will mark to market losses and gains, um, and HTM, which means hold to maturity, uh, at which banks intend to hold these maturity hold these securities until maturity. Now, these securities amounts to just a shy of nine billion dollars. This is in comparison to a stock hoard equity of six point four billion. So. This is definitely okay. Something might be uh, wor worrying here, but fret not. Uh, firstly, just three billion uh, share of three billion is actually hold to maturity, meaning they haven't been marked to market prices. Means there are actually a losses uh, there, and 
uh, any hit in the future will actually come from this section. Uh, the other six billion or so is actually in uh, available for sale, so it's already been marked to market. So uh, we 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 have to account uh, any losses that have occurred has already occurred on the books. Moreover, the bank does have seventeen billion dollars in demand deposits that pays really low rates. So uh, given some time, I think the three billion dollars will easily uh, take care of itself, and it wouldn't really be a big problem just to hold these. Uh, screws. It's actually not that much uh, from a relative perspective, uh, given that three billion hold to market versus an asset about an asset around sixty or so billion uh, is actually a relatively small amount. But it's definitely, we should be look at comparing uh, to the stockholder equity portion, which so far should be fine. We won't be wiped out. Um, and the company mainly uses its deposits for uh, loans, the main, and this is actually the main revenue generator. It has a loan to deposit ratio of just shy of 90%, which is actually quite high. Uh, remember, uh, the Postal Savings Bank of China, United China, in China actually just have a 58% loan to deposit ratio. So meaning that they actually lend on 90 cents to every dollar they take in. Now, this ratio really needs to be balanced short-term profits and risk. At over, as over lending may force us to continue to pay up or resort to higher deposits that could potentially turn negative and too low will suggest that it's not operating efficiently because they're paying for all these deposits but yet they are not able to make money off these deposits. So uh, I think at 90% is actually something I'm comfortable with. Um, I think it, it should be right around there, around the 80-90%. Uh, I like to be more of a conservative side to see if they can earn um, a good net interest uh, margin just with this is itself. Now, if you get, um, unless some other thing happened with really low uh, broker deposits or really low in cash, I think they can get a little bit more aggressive, but I think right now it's probably still a relatively good amount. So after looking at that, we, let's look at the loan book as if there are any major red flag, we should avoid like the play, right? So uh, at first glance, it's something that we, we will give us a worry about. The loan book actually has about 40% in commercial real estate. Now that's like, oh my God, commercial real estate, this is probably one of the worst areas right now to be in. 31% um, in commercial uh, and industrial, so it's like loans to VCs, loans to uh, movie studios, loans to many, any commercial or industrial units. And about 29% uh, is actually in uh, residential mortgages. And broken down by geography is actually about 50% in Southern California, 20% in Northern California, 8% uh, in Texas, 5% in New York, 3% in uh, Washington State, and then 14% elsewhere. Um, so it's very definitely California-centric and California-focused. Um, so it's something that is, is something we need to uh, consider in the back of our mind to see how that is performing. So. The uh, commercial real estate portfolio um, is worrisome uh, given the scale of the death of the office, right? So, but the thing is, commercial real estate doesn't really mean offices only. It actually means, um, you know, like re retail space, industrial space, office, of course, uh, some multifamily housing that people use um, as REITs, uh, there's hotels, etc. So, there's actually a lot of different areas. Um, so definitely something we need to look closely into. So from from our point of view, um, when we take a deep dive into it, it actually sees that office actually only accounts for two point three billion dollars, um, with a weighted average LTV, a loan to value of fifty two percent. So meaning that the value to drop about half or forty percent before any losses uh, can be expected. Now. Uh, office REITs trades in general at 48% discount to net asset value, which directly implies that right now if you sell everything um, on the market, it's probably going to get you at least 52% back, uh, which is the same LTV as East West Bank Corp. All right. So overall, it's, it, it looks like this part of the load is actually quite, um, risk is quite minimal. Uh, there's risk definitely there, but I think uh, right now the low or the low LTV that we have it actually is conservative and it will protect us on our downside. Now, as, as some of the other sections like multifamily, which is a, the largest section, is actually doing really well. Rents, rents are actually a record and supply is constrained. So, um, and I've been playing this trend through positions in like peer side corporations and AIV. 
uh, which I posted videos on as well that uh, you can watch. But I think right now with higher rates, uh, people are more inclined to rent than to buy because they can't afford it. And because housing is constrained of, uh, from COVID and stuff, I think overall, uh, short term wise in the next year or two, it's still going to be uh, low housing inventories that we'll need to uh, take advantage of. Now, in terms of uh, SoCal and NorCal, um, and the issue is that the value that it provides, right? People leave it uh, because it's too expensive and not because they don't like it. And that's a key difference. Uh, is in, So, except the West Coast, Texas and New York are the major areas to continue to continue, continue to be attractive for Asians and Asian Americans coming from Asia. So this is important because um, the Asian community is actually one of the largest communities uh, that's migrating to the United States. And their first steps or their, their preferred locations are exactly, as I said, Washington, uh, California, Texas, New York. So all these are actually playing exactly into the uh, hand of the company. And I'm sure they can easily uh, offload or make some changes as necessary. Um, now, in terms of the, the future of, of California, I think it's still going to be bright. Uh, this, it, the, high, the higher cost of living is because people want to move there. Uh, now people are leaving is because it's too expensive, but I'm sure that sketch has been uh, talked about for years and yet, you know, California is still a booming economy. If you take it out separately, it's still rank as well as the top economies um, in the world. Right? And I think top 10 or something, which is amazing if you think about it. Um, all right, so now the commercial and loans, uh, the commercial industrial loans actually accounts for 3% of loans. So let's talk a little bit about that as well. As you can see here, um, 5% is in private equity, 4% media entertainment, which is basically like uh, move, move, movie studios. And actually there's a question on the earnings call about it, um, about the Hollywood strike and, and what to take advantage of that. So basically they say it's you know, uh, a, a, a no worry. They're actually doing quite well uh, with it. So it's actually quite diversified, this, this 31% across many, many different industries. Um, now I'm sure they will also take uh, good care and uh, price price them accordingly uh, as needed. So overall, it seems that there's nothing to be worried about in this 31 percent. And then the last 29 percent of the loans, uh, which is the single family uh, section, I think uh, I think you do find people are not going to uh, basically pay off their mortgages and try to get a new one because they lock in the rate so cheap, right? So. And if they do reset, I think that's when it becomes uh, interesting. Uh, but I think people are less likely to move than um, because people are less likely to move because it's actually more expensive too. Now, as we look at the loans, we also have a look at the allowable for loan losses. Now, it's just about 1.28 percent at 635 million. Now, this is actually not that high, especially when we look at um, uh, the, the the bank that. Uh, that I like a lot, which is the post savings bank is at over 300%. So it's actually uh, more lower side, but I think it has been moving up overall in a few quarters, uh, particular in the commercial real estate area as you know, more risks are associated, are associated with it. Um, but I think the low amount is actually palatable in relation to the low loan to value that they price. And I don't expect much default uh, within the CRE space and for commercial real estate, it's been relatively flat. So they don't haven't seen any substantial deterioration in those loan book as well. And this is actually pretty in line with overall strong corporate earnings that we've heard quite a bit. Now, uh, the, the American consumer has not dropped off. They have not stopped spending. So we'll have to continue to keep track and see how they perform. But overall, it looks like things are uh, progressing right in the right directions. So. In short, the low allowance can be attributed to the consumer lending that they're making, with the CNI having just a higher loan uh, allowances. Now, aside from this, one of the bank, uh, aside from this, the bank also has great capital ratio that's far above the re regulatory guidelines. Um, management asking analyst questions regarding having too much capital or if they were to increase uh, or start buying back stock or increase the dividends. It is, it is said that. Um, 
the management are not managing for short term and unless there's more certainty and outlook uh, with the in relation with the market um, as well as the Fed, uh, they actually rather err on the conservative side and just to make sure that you know they are built for sustainability. Now, I don't know what you, you guys think about that, but from a long-term investor, this is actually something that I like to hear that we're not trying to make the next quarter looks great. We're actually trying to build something longer and take advantage of um, uh, the situation as possible. It's, it's rather to be safe than sorry. Now, the bank also earns uh, one of the leading net interest margins, which at its peak is close to 4%. Now, remember, I said 2 to 3% as the normal range. So this is a company that's earning close to 4%. Um, at Q, around Q2. It now sits at 3.5% as deposits have shift, as we discussed earlier in the video, uh, along with some mismatching and rate, raising rates for deposit relative to the variable interest rates that's actually um, in the market. So uh, I think that's why it got to 4%. Now, usually bank around 2 to 3%, so I still see it that, um, and for the guidance itself, that it can still maintain above 3, which is uh, definitely great. Now, it is sustainable, so that, that's something that um, we, we want to see as well. So when, when we take a look at it, uh, the loan yield and every spot, the average spot rate, we actually see that um, how much of the loan is actually fixed versus how much of it is variable, right? So if it's variable, that means it will reset uh, every time there is a change and the bank can actually take advantage of that. If it's fixed in a rate, in an increasing rate environment, the spread will compress as is the situation in China at the moment. Um, if it's variable, the bank will see a tailwind similar to Q3 and Q4. Now, overall, 31% of all CNI loans, which is commercial um, uh, of the uh, portfolio is CNI, and they are 88% variable, which means that it will be reset to wherever the market price is, which means we're probably relatively safe there. In commercial real estate, 40% of a loan book, which is 40% of a loan book, is 63% variable. Um, and 44% of these customers actually have um, interest rate protections that the bank helped them uh, acquire early in the year, uh, late last year, early this year. So it's relatively stable that even though it's good that it's 63%, it allow them is actually variable for the bank, uh, while the downside risk has been protected by another third party. Now, uh, with a single family uh, areas, if it's 45, 41%, fixed and 43% hybrid, which means that it's locked for an initial period before moving to variable. Um, in short, you can think about it as that 60% is variable, 40% is fixed. Um, so, you know, when, when we try to back it out in our head, uh, from, from early discussion, the deposit currently sits around 17, uh, 17 billion. Uh, the 55, 55 billion are fixed, which is about 31%. So, um, 17 is basically the time deposit base that is currently fixed at the price. So we'll, if, when we take a look at it, a 31% is fixed in the deposit point of view, but 40% of it is fixed um, in our net interest margin. I think something that can uh, be maintained at around 3%, 3%. Now, in a longer view, only 25% of it is actually truly fixed, right? So um, with the remaining variable pairing it with about 30% demand deposits today, you're looking at um, a situation where you're still going to be able to take advantage of the higher rates or the, the fluctuation and repricing as time occurs. So there's still lots of deposit um, uh, cushions that we can continue to take uh, in, in, in a longer run. Now, from a prof, 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 uh, sorry, from a uh, product of, standpoint uh, it looks like they're able to they're going to be able to maintain their industry leading net interest margins although harder to dissect is where or not there's there will be a some tailwind in deposit bank deposit base as the bank expand organic or through strategic acquisitions like they did during the great financial crisis uh, by buying one of their largest competitors um, from basically immigrants right so a so Asian as a segment of the US population is expected to grow, continue to grow with some estimates that it will be 10% of the U.S. population by 2050 from 6% today, suggesting roughly around a 2% tailwind in total addressable market uh, going forward. Now, in conclusion, I think the bank earned about 220 in the last quarter. Uh, if we analyze it, it's about 888 a year. Bank trades roughly around $53, suggesting a P ratio of about six, right? 
So it pays about $1.92 in dividends, which is a 3%, 3.6% dividend um, that's well covered and uh, will likely be increased once the cloud clears. So it seems, uh, in short, that the East-West Bank was actually a case where the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. Um, and that if you actually are long term and have enough patience, the bank is actually one that will likely going to outperform the market uh, and make it make, make, make it a very good investment down the line that will pay off very nicely. So that's why uh, even though the time has come to decide whether or not I want to flip it back to my initial, initial position or keep it riding East West Bank, I decided to keep it because um, I think that it will continue to perform well down the road as well. All right, that's all I have for East West Bank. Till next.